leaf hoppers can be some of the most common and abundant of all the insects in the order Hemiptera associated with plants. However, it is relatively uncommon for people to notice their effects uh, because often they are producing no visible injury and the insects themselves are fairly small. The leafhopper family includes uh, hundreds of species in uh, North America and in general they are a little bit bigger than aphids, uh, maybe a couple times bigger than an aphid, and have a very elongate body form. Uh, they also readily fly uh, and uh, may jump from the plant. The, the hopping part of the leaf hopper is they may launch themselves from a plant into flight. Now, there are a range of kinds of plant injuries that can be produced by leaf hoppers. Um, sometimes it's from removing sap. Uh, and the effects of uh, the removal of, of, of sap as they're feeding depends on where they're feeding. Some feed on the phloem, some feed on the xylem, some feed on the mesophyll. There's one case, not a very big uh, situation in this part of the country, but it is very important, a little to the east, involve hopper burns, which uh, involve a, a genus of leaf hoppers that can produce some serious effects uh, through the uh, damage to the phloem and the plant's response to their feeding injury. Some will cause stippling, uh, those that feed on the mesophyll. And there are several cases where leaf hoppers are important as vectors of a pathogen, uh, in some cases bacterium, in some cases a virus. However, most leaf hoppers probably would not attract the attention of a gardener or a grower. Uh, they'd be perceived as some little small flying thing that comes off the plant when you walk by and you don't see any visible injury uh, because they don't do much. Uh, most leaf hoppers are feeding on the phloem and if there's no other associated issue with them, with and that's the case with almost all, uh, it's only rare exceptions where we see damaging species of phloem feeders, uh, you'll see no visible visible damage at all. Uh, it'll just be you know, some little flying insect, some little might mistake it for a little fly or, or a midge or something. Now there is this case of the phloem feeding uh, uh, members of the genus Empoasca that can produce uh, pretty profound injuries called hopper burns and this is produced uh, from the feeding of the insect itself, perhaps from some kind of mechanical injuries that it produces, some effects of the saliva that can seriously destroy the uh, phloem of the plant. The plant also apparently uh, reacts to the way that this insect feeds and, and further uh, uh, causes the destruction of the phloem so that you get uh, the plant uh, reducing its ability to photosynthesize uh, fairly dramatically, but also it can't move uh, sugars and so uh, the sugars tend to concentrate along the leaf edges uh, and then these then die and often there's kind of a progressive dieback uh, from this hopper burn so that the, the, the burning uh, appearance of, of the leaf is how they get their names. Uh, so. We can see hopper burns in a couple of, of vegetable crops. Uh, occasionally we'll get them on pumpkin and some of the squash. Uh, and there might be again this kind of marginal necrosis uh, that's the result of these small green insects that are feeding on the underside of the leaf. More to the mid Midwest, uh, you have hopper burn being a chronic and very important pest on potatoes. Uh, we'll cause potato crops often to uh, be killed weeks before uh, they would normally uh, be maturing uh, through this progressive dieback uh, produced by the hopper burn reaction from the effects of the leaf hopper feeding. Again, hopper burns though aren't, aren't a big deal in the high plains. They're more a Midwest problem. Hopper burns also can affect nursery plants too, uh, in particular maples, but uh, a great many nursery plants can have uh, marginal leaf burning and greatly retarded growth from the effects of the potato leaf hopper 
the most notorious of all the hopper burn producing leafhoppers we have in North America. Some leafhoppers feed on the xylem and the subfamily that feeds on the xylem we call sharpshooters. Uh, these are sometimes some of the larger of the leafhoppers. They're also marked by having a very enlarged head. The, the front of the head is, is uh, uh, larger and that's because uh, they have a large muscular pump in the front of the head that is what you need in order to extract fluid from the xylem. They also will excrete a watery waste and the watery fluid is flicked from the body. So were you to look at a, a leaf that had multiple sharpshooter leaf hoppers on it and, and look a few inches away at them, you might feel a, a light rain on your face from the uh, flicking of the sharp, sharp shooting flicks of the uh, watery waste that they're, they're producing. But again, like most phloem feeders, with the exception of the hopper burn producers, sharpshooter leafhoppers do not produce any visible injuries. You, you don't see anything. It's not even a spot. Now, leafhoppers that do produce a visible leaf injury are those that feed on the mesophyll. And these will uh, destroy several cells at a feeding site, and you get a classic stippling injury reaction. So there are a handful of, of leafhoppers that produce this, and, and probably uh, for most garden plants, the most co common cause of a stippling kind of injury is one of these mesophyll feeding leafhoppers. Now normally this is a fairly insignificant kind of injury as well, but it sometimes becomes fairly extensive and, and noticeable. Uh, one that is, is fairly common is rose leafhopper. It produces white chlorotic flecking on roses in the first few weeks of the season. It later then moves to fruit trees. Uh, so it's a transient kind of early season problem you see. Uh, the white apple leafhopper as well as the rose leafhopper might be found on fruit trees during the summertime. Again producing little flecking wounds on say an apple or a crab apple. Virginia creeper uh, has a leafhopper that sometimes can be quite quite uh, 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 damaging in uh, appearance of the plant. Uh, can get a lot of flecking and, and uh, sometimes even leaves will, will die from uh, massive populations of the Virginia creeper leafhopper or the zigzag leafhopper. And uh, grape also has leafhoppers common to it that produce a stippling injury that uh, may progress to something a little more uh, extensive if you have high numbers of these leafhoppers. By the way, the leafhoppers that feed on the mesophyll will also typically excrete a small, dark, watery, perhaps somewhat tarry spots. So you'll get stippling uh, as well as the small spotting on the leaf that will help be able to diagnose these. The big issue with leafhoppers is when they become a, important as a vector for some kind of plant pathogen. And there are several plant pathogens that are vectored by leafhoppers that can damage crops, uh, uh, vegetable crops, flower crops. Uh, viruses are transmitted by leafhoppers, and the primary virus that we have that's leafhopper transmitted here is beet curly top. Phytoplasmas, a type of bacterium, uh, are represented uh, very well, at least in areas east of the continental divide, by the disease known as aster yellows, which is transmitted by the leafhopper from plant to plant. The xylem limited bacteria are a group of bacteria found in the xylem producing various scorched diseases. And these are quite important in some areas of the country. Not important here, but, but let's talk about those first. So some sharpshooters are involved in, in the, the transmission of the xylem bacteria, limited bacteria because the sharpshooters, of course, are the only leafhoppers that feed on the xylem. So these are, are growing in the xylem and they uh, are picked up by an insect that feeds in, in that feeding site and then subsequently they may transmit to other, other plants. The, the big one is called Pierce's disease of grape 
and this is produced by infection with a strain of Xylella fastidiosa. Uh, this is the number one grape pest problem currently in California, and we also see some incidence of Pierce's disease of grape in, in other areas, uh, Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, but this is manifested as most of these island lemon bacteria by, by kind of a scorch symptom, which again is because the uh, pathogen is affecting the xylem, the part of the plant that is going to normally move water. In the east, there's a strain of Xylella fastidiosa, and also in California, that produces symptoms on various kinds of trees, called bacterial leaf scorch, oaks, sycamore, in particular, are, are some that are, are quite badly affected. And this can result in a disease that is progressive, and uh, can cause decline of a tree to the point of making it uh, undesirable in terms of any aesthetics over, over time. Again, this is not a disease that has ever been identified here in Colorado, but uh, is known from other areas to, both to the east and west of us. Now, a leafhopper transmitted disease that is quite important, particularly in uh, the southern parts of eastern Colorado and on the west slope is beet curly top. Now this is a disease that is caused by infection with a virus that is moved from plant to plant by an insect, the beet leafhopper. And beet curly top virus uh, can uh, damage many commonly grown plants. Uh, it's best known because of its effects on sugar beets, but it also affects other kinds of beets. Uh, you might see it on beans, uh, chili peppers, and particularly tomatoes are the crops that are most commonly affected in this region, at least in a serious way. You get uh, smaller plants, you get uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, leaf necrosis, and uh, death, uh, premature death is, is usually the result, particularly on tomatoes and, and peppers. It can be quite devastating, and it results from a leafhopper moving this virus uh, from a plant it previously acquired it from uh, to a healthy plant and in a single feeding episode it can introduce the virus in less than 20 minutes at least the time it takes to reach the phloem uh, and once infected the plant is irre irreversibly uh, affected by this virus there is no cure for a viral disease so it's a insect vector disease involving a virus. Symptoms uh, on tomato, again, is the probably the most commonly affected crop. The, I think the best symptoms are indicated in this Utah State photo on the lower right, showing the, the grossly enlarged calyx on the, the, of the, the two fruit uh, we see. The one on the right is showing the uh, symptoms of, of beet curly top. The plants stunted, yellow, leaves die, the plant may die, there are other causes that could produce this, uh, but beet curly top is one to consider in this part of the country. And finally, we have the aster leafhopper, which is an insect that of itself is of no consequence in terms of damaging plants, but it is again a vector of a pathogen, and the pathogen that it transmits from plant to plant is a Phytoplasma, a type of bacteria, uh, bacterium that produces aster yellows disease. And aster yellows disease can affect a great many plants we commonly grow. So aster yellows is a disease caused by infection with the aster yellows phytoplasma, again a type of bacterium. But the only way that this bacterium can be moved from plant to plant is through an insect vector. And the insect vector is the aster leafhopper, sometimes known as the six-spotted leafhopper because it has six spots on the front of its head, and it is the primary vector of aster yellows. There are some others that are involved, uh, but the aster leafhopper is, uh, over most of the United States, by far the most important vector of this pathogen. The aster yellows bacterium is acquired by this leafhopper uh, in the course of feeding on an infected plant. The uh, bacterium then grows actually within the leafhopper uh, and will 
uh, subsequently be available to be transmitted for the rest of its life. Ester leaf hopper is a, an insect that is not going to normally attract attention. Uh, again, most leaf hoppers don't. Uh, typical life history of, of the aster leaf hopper. We have the adult lays eggs into leaves. The uh, young uh, hatch from the egg and they get progressively larger. Later stages are going to have uh, visible wing pads and then the last molt they turn into the adult. But again, not an insect that normally attracts much attention. Now some notes on the aster leaf hopper and it's associated with aster yellows. The aster leaf hopper is an insect that is not a year-round resident in the colder areas uh, in winter. It survives between seasons, between growing seasons, along the Gulf of Mexico. So new problems arise annually from migrants that are coming up from, from uh, uh, southern areas. I failed to mention earlier, the beet leafhopper is also an annual migrant. It moves up from southern areas such as Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas. So new problems arise annually from migrants. Some years large numbers of migrants will come, sometimes few, but it's also important uh, in terms of whether we're going to have a problem, uh, in terms uh, how, how many of them are infected. Some years maybe less than one percent will be carrying the aster yellows bacterium in their body when they arrive to Colorado or this part of the country. Some years it might be maybe five percent, uh, in which case uh, we're setting, we're set up for an outbreak. Now, now these pathogens ha have a involved association with the insect. I mean not every leafhopper is a vector, very few of them are. Uh, because there has to be a biological association of that pathogen with the insect uh, that is very elaborate and specific that allows it to become a vector. So in this case with uh, the aster leafhopper and the aster yellows bacterium, upon feeding on a plant infected with aster yellows, a period of 10 to 14 days must pass before it can transmit the bacteria to a new plant. And this is called a latent period. So, so basically what happens is a, a leafhopper lands on a plant that has the bacterium in it, acquires it by feeding in the phloem where this bacterium is, is located, but then it has to travel into the body, it moves through the midgut, it moves into the hemolymph, the blood of the insect, it migrates to the salivary glands and other tissues and actually replicates in the insect and then after 10 to 14 days, it then has enough of the bacteria in its salivary glands, so after that point, it can uh, pass new bacteria onto new healthy plants. But this is called a latent period, so this is not a situation where the insect picks it up and then can move it to another plant. It picks it up and 10 to 14 days have to pass for the pathogen to cycle through the insect. Once capable of transmitting the bacteria, after that latent period has passed, the leaf hoppers are infective for life and they may live uh, several months. So, this disease, Aster yellows, what are we going to see in terms of it symptoms that it produces on, on plants? Well, some of the plants it affects are, are vegetable crops and probably carrots are the plant that is most consistently affected. And you see a couple of different symptoms with aster yellows on, on carrots. The picture in the upper left shows the top growth looking very dense, very bushy. Uh, this would be a symptom we might call a witch's broom, uh, where you get lots of little spindly shoots rather than normal uh, elongated uh, uh, leaves. And that's, that's a symptom we'll see on some other plants as well. You also often get some color change, and the picture on the upper right shows this to some degree. You get some bronzing. There's some bronzing of the leaves that is often also visible, which makes it a little easier to detect. In the picture on the lower right, we see three carrots uh, that have various ranges of symptoms of aster yellows. The one on the right would be a healthy carrot. The one on the left is one that got infected at a fairly early growth stage by this bacterium and you can see a couple things that are going on with it. One is the top growth that I 
mentioned before, is, is the dense witch's broom, so it's not normally elongating. Uh, but the thing that's more obvious is the roots are smaller and they're very hairy. So the hairy rootedness of, of uh, uh, hairy, hairy rootedness is, is a very common symptom of Aster Yellow's infection on a carrot. The carrot in the middle looks like it has uh, slight symptoms, probably got infected at a later growth stage. So the above ground symptoms, witch's broom, some leaf bronzing, and production of smaller hairy roots for below ground symptoms for Aster Yellow's. So that's what it looks like on carrot. Head lettuce is another uh, crop that can be very badly damaged and if you have infection on head lettuce uh, the new growth will fail to normally uh, grow. It'll come out in a twisted way uh, so you can't form a head. Uh, they will also affect uh, leaf lettuce too and uh, the symptoms are not going to be as dramatic but uh, it may sufficiently distort the, the growth of leaf lettuce as well so they don't uh, uh, produce a, a marketable head. Another symptom is production of latex spotting. So uh, if you have uh, head lettuce that you're trying to grow and it, it looks twisted and you look a little close and you see these dark spots on the leaves, that's probably uh, an indication that that plant has been infected with aster yellows. You see it on some other plants every once in a while. You might see it on potatoes, you might see it on onions. Again, a kind of a, a twisting, a yellowing, uh, in this case on, on the onion to the right, but more of a curiosity on these crops. The, the big two that get affected are carrots and leaf lettuce. In other parts of the country, celery is another crop that is uh, sometimes badly affected by aster yellows. Now, aster yellows also goes to a great many plants that we grow as flowers, and one of the more dramatic effects on some of the flowers is a condition known as phyllity, where the uh, plant uh, loses the ability to produce normal petals, normal flower head, and it reverts to more perhaps leaf-like form. So we see phyllity in all three of these pictures on, on different plants. Uh, again, we see normal, normal uh, petals in, in some of the flowers, and then those that look distorted, uh, are those that are showing symptoms of phyllity, this abnormal reversion of the flower parts to a more leaf-like form that is a symptom associated with aster yellow's infection. So here we see phyllity of, of, of flowers in cosmos, a uh, uh, very dramatic uh, change in the, in the growth of the flowers in the picture in the upper left. The larger picture of the, the whole plant uh, you can see in the lower right and kind of a yellowing and pretty much a uh, complete cessation of, of normal flower production so this will this will permanently uh, uh, stop the production of, of normal flowering uh, which is brooming leaf bronzing and flower fillity are all indicated in this series of pictures it happens to be status of a plant we grow for cut uh, for dried uh, flowers. Uh, on the lower right you can see the stunting, you can see the bronzing, very dramatic, uh, and that uh, uh, plant on the, on the lower right, and more of the witch's brewing effect on the picture on the upper left. In marigold, uh, the flowers will uh, fail to form normally. Uh, you can see a range of uh, effect depending on, on at what point the the plant was infected with aster yellow, so we see in the lower right a healthy flower, next to it two flowers showing various stages of, of uh, effect from aster yellow's infection. Sometimes it's a little more subtle. Uh, Vinca on the lower, lower, lower left picture, uh, the plant is a little yellow, stunted, not producing flowers. Uh, and the petunia, uh, same thing, a little yellowing and just fails to produce flowers. A leaf hopper came by maybe a month before this time this picture was taken, fed on a plant, introduced the bacterium that produces aster yellows, and it then developed to uh, form this, this permanent uh, effect on the future growth of the plant. 
managing leaf hopper vectored plant pathogens is very difficult. We have insects uh, that are uh, transient, that arise from areas that are outside the region. So their incidence is going to be very irregular and it's going to be dependent on uh, migrations. The insects, if they are here uh, and feed on plants, can introduce the pathogen within a matter of minutes, certainly within less than half an hour, uh, which makes uh, trying to kill them uh, very difficult. So basically, the principles of managing leafhopper vector plant pathogens is to monitor and detect incipient infestations. The best way to do this is through trapping or sweep nets. In some cases, we could use row covers. Uh, since this is a migrant insect, uh, if you have row covers, they could be a way to exclude the insect from getting onto the plant. And that's the whole point. You can't let the insect land on the plant because then it will transmit the pathogen. Use of repellent reflective mulches can deter landing. So uh, in this case, we're talking perhaps a luminized mulch, something that reflects a lot of the background, uh, that reflects on, from the soil uh, light, so it confuses the, the landing of, of these potential vectors. Insecticides, I have as a question mark. I mean, insecticides, can be used to some effect, but they're not very effective. Uh, and in order to be effective, they have to be in place, in high concentration, on the plant, at the moment a migrant leafhopper lands on that plant. And that would require repeated applications uh, pretty much throughout the period that the insects are going to be migrating into the crop. Uh, and in many cases, even when repeated insecticide applications are made, the results are disappointing. This is not a kind of insect problem that is managed well at all with insecticides. The point is to try to keep them from landing on the crop in the first place. But again, it is an insect like the potato psyllid, like the beet leaf hopper, uh, that is an annual migrant and every year is different from the last year. Uh, each year is independent so the problems we have in one year have nothing to do with the likelihood of problems the next. So it's an insect that we have to be vigilant and be on the lookout for every year uh, and uh, one that uh, we try to prevent from getting on the crop in the first place as a way to, to manage it because the options are fairly limited. Let's just hope it's not going to be a bad Astro Yellows year this year.